This was the highly specialized economy of Sri Lanka. It had a thriving textiles industry. It was one of the biggest tire producers in the world and it was known as a world-class tourist destination with average incomes double that of its neighbors. But now Sri Lanka's economy is as good as dead. Inflation is almost 60%, the government has defaulted on its foreign loans and the central bank had to let the rupee crash when it almost ran out of foreign currency reserves. And without foreign currency reserves, the country is no longer able to buy crucial imports such as fuel, food and medicine. And as a consequence, it's experiencing regular power outages, had to close schools and ration fuel. So that raises the question, who killed Sri Lanka's economy? There are four main suspects. First, there's Russia, whose invasion of Ukraine triggered an explosion of fuel and food prices. Second, there's the United States, whose interest rate hikes are putting enormous pressure on Sri Lanka's dollar-dependent economy. Third, there's China, who had quickly become one of Sri Lanka's biggest creditors. And then finally, there's the government itself, which stands accused of corruption and gross incompetence. Most notably by forcing Sri Lankan farmers to go eco-friendly, banning fertilizers and thereby ruining the harvest. So let's closely inspect each of these subjects and see who is the real killer. The case against Russia is the following. When it invaded Ukraine, fuel and food prices went through the roof. This was a big problem because while Sri Lanka had thriving industries, it consistently ran a trade deficit. This means that while it earned foreign currency with textiles, tea, tourism and tires, it spent much more than that on imports. Imports like fuel and wheat. And to do so, like any net importer, it needed to borrow foreign currency. So when Russia's war drove up energy and wheat prices, this immediately made Sri Lanka's trade deficit much worse. It also meant that foreign investors were no longer willing to lend to Sri Lanka. As a consequence, the government quickly ran out of foreign currency. And without foreign currency, the economy is now literally running out of fuel. In other words, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it also killed Sri Lanka's economy. Or so you'd think, because there are actually a couple of problems with this narrative. First, unlike some countries in the Middle East and Africa, Sri Lanka is not that dependent on wheat imports. After all, its diet is mostly rice-based. And while rice prices have also been going up steadily, this has been linked to bad weather conditions in, amongst others, China, not to Russia's invasion. Rising fuel prices have clearly been a big problem for Sri Lanka though. However, in Russia's defense, it's been selling to Sri Lanka at discounted prices. What's more, there are plenty of oil importing nations that have not collapsed after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So in the end, while Russia's invasion proved a big problem for Sri Lanka's economy, perhaps we should also take a critical look at its geopolitical rival, the United States and in particular its financial sector. Hey, what's up everybody? I created this channel to keep you up to date on the latest developments in the global economy without cutting any corners. So that means tying current developments to economic theory, using data wherever possible to validate, using animations and finally doing a lot, a lot of research. And so in all honesty, to make more content, I basically need a research assistant. But at the moment, I simply cannot afford one. So if you want to help me make more researched videos, then please consider supporting the channel using the donation links in the description of this video, or perhaps even better by becoming a patron or member of this channel. What's more, patrons and members get access to an exclusive Discord community where I now organize a monthly live Q&A discussion session. The case that actually the United States killed Sri Lanka's economy is stronger than you might think. Because sure, Sri Lanka is pretty far from the United States. However, like most emerging markets, Sri Lanka relies for a large part on the global dollar-based financial system to fund itself. And that is what connects the US to the death of Sri Lanka's economy. You see, in line with US economic thinking, Sri Lanka relaxed both its capital controls and exchange rate in around 2001. Right after that, the country experienced a surge in private capital flows. Now that sounds like a good thing, right? However, economists have identified 
two big problems with these types of capital flows. The first problem is that global private investors don't necessarily care about those projects that are macroeconomically sustainable. They care about quick returns. So it made sense that a lot of this private investment flowed into Sri Lanka's booming stock and property markets. Sectors that don't immediately help if you have a big trade deficit. In fact, they can make the trade deficit worse by making people feel rich and therefore enticing them to import more. The second problem is that foreign private capital is known to be short-term oriented and jumpy. Economists like Alain Ray have shown that increasingly relying on global financial markets make emerging markets more vulnerable to something that is called the global financial cycle. The idea of the global financial cycle is that asset booms and busts are more and more aligned globally. This means that, for example, if property markets in the US are going up, it's more likely that they are also going up in Europe and also in emerging markets like in this case Sri Lanka. Global financial booms such as these tend to be boosted by low interest rates in the United States. Conversely, dollar-based private finance tends to run home when the US raises interest rates, setting in motion a bust everywhere. So did US interest rate hikes scare international private investors into killing Sri Lanka's economy? Well, the timing is just as suspicious as it is with Russia. The US started raising interest rates to combat inflation at home around March this year. And right after, Sri Lanka's currency started collapsing. However, there's also some key evidence that might prove that the US and the global financial system is not to blame. Firstly, while it's easy to say that global private finance is just looking for a quick buck, it's undeniable that Sri Lanka's private sector had grown rapidly in these last few years. In 2019, Sri Lanka's impressive tourist industry made it so that it was the Lonely Planet's top tourist destination of the year. Also, its IT industry continued to do well throughout the pandemic. And finally, its textiles industry had grown to be one of the biggest exporters to the United States and Europe. All of these industries arguably benefited quite a lot from access to international capital markets. Furthermore, foreign direct investment into Sri Lanka had already started declining in 2017, well before the US raised its interest rates. In fact, you could even argue that the US saved Sri Lanka when it started stimulating its economy in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, precisely at the moment that tourism revenue collapsed for Sri Lanka. What's more, in the last few years, Sri Lanka has started borrowing more and more, not from Western financial markets, but from China. So, what's the case against China? Well, officially it has become, just in the span of a couple of years and together with its Export-Import Bank, one of the biggest lenders to Sri Lanka. However, unofficially we have no idea how big its role really is. You see, China is very secretive about both how much it lends to emerging market economies and under which conditions. And just like with private capital inflows, it doesn't really have to be a bad thing, right? And unlike Wall Street's need for a quick buck, China is known for playing the long game. Its state-owned banks mainly lend to foreign governments and government-affiliated companies. Even better, they typically fund infrastructure projects and developing countries like Sri Lanka badly need infrastructure products. So how could you hold China responsible for the death of Sri Lanka's economy? Well, it stands accused of bad lending practices. Not funding the infrastructure products that the economy badly needed, but funding the infrastructure products that its politicians badly needed to line their own pockets. It stands accused of not caring whether an infrastructure project can earn enough money to pay back the loan that it lent for it. As long as the government can pay back for it in other ways, China doesn't care. And if the government cannot pay back, then China doesn't have the reputation that is willing to write down debt like some Western creditors occasionally do. Although it might be willing to forgive the loan in exchange for the infrastructure asset if it happens to be strategically valuable to China. The most famous example of this is Sri Lanka's Hambantota port. This port was deemed commercially unfeasible and therefore no Western or Indian creditor was willing to fund it. However, the location of this port just so happened to be in the home province of former president Mahinda Rajapaksa. This means that it was actually a very attractive project for the president himself. 
Not only did this buy a lot of goodwill with his core voter demographics, but it also offered a lot of opportunities for work for local friendly subcontractors. So despite the port clearly not making a lot of economic sense, China's Export-Import Bank was willing to fund it. Sadly, but not surprisingly, when the billion dollar port was finished in 2012, it only drew in 34 ships. So not surprisingly, when a new government came into power, it could no longer afford to pay the debts to China. Luckily, at that point, China stepped in and bought most of the port and the land surrounding it for a lease for 99 years. And this is just the most notorious example. There are many more examples where Chinese loans made projects possible that weren't very beneficial to the economy, left the country in debt, but were very, very beneficial for the Raja Paksa family members. So that's the case against China in a nutshell. Much like the case against US finance, it loaded up the country with the wrong kind of debt. But in this case, the debt that made its politicians very rich and the country very poor. That being said, these are only the negative examples. Just like with private finance, there are also a lot of projects that were great for Sri Lanka that were built with Chinese money. For example, a brand new terminal at Colombo Sport has arguably helped that port grow tremendously. What's more, there are other countries that borrowed far more money from China and are in far less trouble than Sri Lanka is now. Finally, you may have noticed that in all of these cases of Chinese lending to wasteful projects, one name kept coming up, that of the Raja Paksa family. Could the Raja Paksa's mismanagement actually be the real reason that Sri Lanka was never able to grow a balanced economy? The case against the family built on the fact that shortly after Mahinda Rajapaksa came to power in 2005, he started installing family members and friends on key government positions. And typically installing family members there means that you're not necessarily installing the most competent people, but rather the most loyal people. Sure, during Mahinda's reign, the economy grew at a rapid speed and even became a middle income country. Also, under their reign, Sri Lanka's civil war finally came to an end. So, no wonder that they were so popular that they could get re-elected for a second term. However, their increasingly dictatorial tendencies and terrible government services and corruption led them to being voted out of office in 2015. But then after a terrorist attack in 2019, Gotabaya Rajapaksa was elected as the new president. And so the Rajapaksa family was back. Now he promised a hard line on terrorism and sweeping tax cuts, which was probably a bit of a mistake given that government finances were already running low. However, there's an even more striking example of the Rajapaksa's governance incompetence. You see, with a lofty goal of environmental sustainability, Gotabaya banned all fertilizers. Eco-farming all the way, it seemed. Although some have also suggested that this was a move to import less fertilizers. But whichever of the two cases really motivated him, this turned out to be a disaster of epic proportions. Without fertilizer, Sri Lanka's harvest started failing. Meaning that it now not only turned into an importer of rice, some of its other agricultural exports also started failing. So rather than saving foreign currency reserves, this move made Sri Lanka bleed foreign currency reserves. So the case against the Rajapaksa family is that while they brought stability to the country initially, they completely trashed its economy. They prioritized borrowing for projects that would make them rich and not the country. They failed to deliver crucial government services. They presided over a culture of corruption. And finally, they pushed the country over the edge by banning fertilizers. However, in their defense, you could argue that actually when the opposition was in power between 2015 and 2019, they didn't do enough to turn the situation around. Or you could argue that a lot of countries have incompetent governments and that Sri Lanka was just extremely unlucky because first it was hit by a terrorist attack and then tourists completely stayed away after COVID-19. What's more, it was then hit by a fuel and food shock thanks to Russia, an interest rate shock thanks to the United States. And finally, all of that Raja Paksa corruption was only possible thanks to Chinese money. But do you buy those excuses? Because now it's up to you. You've heard the four main narrative. You've heard the pros and the cons. Now it's time to cast your votes. Who is mainly responsible for the death of Sri Lanka's economy? 
Check out the first comment under this video for a link to a poll on Twitter. Or if you're eager to get my personal opinion on this or other matters, then consider becoming a patron or a member of this channel using the links in the description of the video. This will also give you access to an exclusive Discord community where I hold a monthly live Q&A. Finally, if you want to know more about why developing countries fail, check out this video over here about the economy of Afghanistan or this video over here about the dangers of financial globalization.